I, I think you know, innovative tax or innovation is not just you know creating a new tax, but we need uh, something different. So I try to define uh, innovation as a vitality of the web services. So uh, once you have some different tags or different photos, then the web services becomes more uh, sort of uh, vital. That's what I want to call uh, innovative something. And then I measure uh, hoax processes. I don't have time to describe it, but one of those, you know, uh, <coughs> posts affect the other posts, right? So the one of the likes is uh, affecting the other uh, likes, so that there is a accumulation of the posting from uh, from the users. So, um, <coughs> so this is a kernel. Uh, this is a kernel form. Is uh, I mean, <coughs> this is one of the generic forms of the kernel, like this one. And you can see from the beginning of the uh, services. There's uh, there are some kind of, kind of transitions from uh, very sort of inactive to a very active one. So this is one of the clue that there is some kind of transition happening in this web service, even though there is a sort of constantly creating new terms and it's not, it's not constantly changing. However, from the viewpoint of of, of uh, this hoax process, there is something in there, right? And also we change the kernel to a much simpler one, like exponential terms. Then. I'm measuring like a, a over B. A over B is like an intrinsic uh, a creative uh, potential of this uh, system. And then measuring A over B terms <coughs> as a horizontal axis. Then first of all, there is a uh, like uh, there are uh, uh, distribution like this. But this peak goes to uh, to number one, right? Uh, a over B equals to one means that this system becomes okay, this system becomes critical. So this web service is evolving into the critical state. But as you know, the evolution might be in the social uh, self-organized critical state. Right? This one is another probably another example. Of evolution once it is active, then it goes to the critical state, and this shows that system is in a critical state. So my conclusion is that um, the web system maintains activity by increasing whatever you know progressive way. But certain types of tags stimulate users to. Uh, to you know, invent new combinations, right? like as I said. Uh, so it's not just a tag, it's, it's characterizing this photo, but the tag itself is interesting and it's just creating something new. Right? So it's independent from tag, and this tag is become very interesting. So the user is looking at the tag and try to use, you know, use those tags to upload their, tag, uh, their photos. So it's not, the selection is not on the photo, but also for the tags. So tag is not just, just okay, not just a genetic gel types, but it's a photo, maybe a gel types. Huh? So it's switching between uh, photos and tags is the interesting one. So finally, uh, what I want to say is that um, so innovation is not just uh, innovative tags, but have to think about how, what's the vitality of the old photo systems increasing by having those kind of transitions. Right? Any questions? Okay. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, interesting talk. Uh, I think that the, the way that you look at the tax uh, it looks to me like you're maybe another kind of open-endedness, which is open-ended behavior. Maybe not just technology evolution like Mark is studying, but because people are putting these tags, it's not necessarily something like pattern creation, but it means maybe that human behavior is uh, also open-ended, and your research is showing yeah. that uh, happening. Yes, yes. I mean, the people are usually criticizing because there's a human being there, right? So it's not a, a closed system. However, you think about you know closed system and human as a maximum demon, right? Like this people, right? <laughs> and then you can you know uh, processing information. Then still you can have openness is an interesting thing, right? So you can you know have a human as a maximum demon is my excuse. And then <laughs> Tom says um, yes, this study is interesting. It's not always you know uh, addressing the photo ID, but it's the tags processing system itself is independent, able to open end system which captures how human behavior is like, right? So it's like a natural relation of human behavior. Yes, right? yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another talk uh, from Tom Fox. So this is uh, just a, a mini presentation of uh, five minutes, and then we can move on to the general discussion. Oh. Let's see if I can do it in PowerPoint.
So uh, this uh, media presentation brought up a uh, conversation I had with uh, Mark at the conference on emergence in chemical systems recently. And at that uh, conference, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of uh, biochemists. And one of them, Peter Stravisky, recently uh, published this uh, article where he's trying to get something that looks to me like uh, the problem of open-ended uh, evolution. So even though biologists are not talking about it, I think people in the origin of life community are talking about it. And uh, in his view, he says any chemical system with perfectly identified components and starting condition is highly unlikely to self-evolve. Uh, and he said, well, we have some measuring errors, so it's not well-defined, never, in, in that sense, practical uncertainties do exist. But if we start with such a well-defined system, then it will maybe evolve a little bit, but then stop. So it will be useful to some extent, but it will never be like life. So that sounds to me like what we're finding in artificial life in multiple systems. So it looks like biochemists actually face the same problem, which is interesting. So why? You know, why does he have the situation that well-defined systems are not capable of giving rise to open-ended evolution? Uh, in fact, he argues that uh, we have better chance of success if the system is messy. And you know, Takashi always talks about messy systems as well. So uh, um, why does he, he think that? You know, he says we should put as many possible variants as possible in the starting conditions to have a chance of getting open, open uh, evolution. So my proposal here is to say, can we formalize this intuition in some sense? And I'm not a mathematician by, by training, so maybe this is something, you know, some logical error here, and then we're happy to hear about it from you. So I propose that one measuring, one way of measuring openness is in terms of systems' uh, degrees of freedom, new emerging degrees of freedom. So if you define uh, emergence uh, as uh, the collective dynamics resulting from nonlinear coupling between two or more components, and I present that as a general definition of, of you know, the physical world. You have components that are interacting with each other in some nonlinear way, and new things happen yeah, out of that interaction. So if we, if we take that as our starting point, that means that the collective dynamics can never have a, a degree of freedom greater than the sum of the degrees of freedom of the individual components. That means in practice, uh, there will be much less degrees of, freedom, degrees of freedom at the higher level because of the additional constraints that are happening through the interactions of the components. So graphically, if we had uh, two individual components with five variables each, five degrees of freedom each, and they were interacting, then the collective variable will, by definition, have something that is less than 10. I mean, it could be, depends on the kind of interaction that's happening, but it will never be greater than, than the amount of degrees of freedom that the individual components have. So, uh, and the same logic applies again if you think about the next level of emergence. So if you then have new components that are emergent, and they're interacting with each other, then the same applies again. There will be less degrees of freedom at the next higher level, and that means that the open-ended, the possibilities for open-ended evolution quickly get choked off until we reach a point where there are no more degrees of freedom left. So if we had a second level of emergence, now from those components, it will have even less degrees of freedom. So that goes against the situation that we heard several times this morning, that the higher we go up the hierarchy, the more possibilities we have. It seems that mathematically, at least, it's the opposite. That the higher we go up, the less possibilities we have. So how do we avoid this dead end in terms of degrees of freedom? Well, it has been mentioned that in practice, it might not be a problem. If our base is, has a huge number of degrees of freedom, maybe we'll never reach this dead end, right? Even though in our simulations, it might be a problem, because we cannot put enough complexity at the bottom to have something interesting happening at the top. But I propose that there's another way of thinking about this which avoids the problem altogether, in principle. And that is to assume that maybe there's no bottom layer. Maybe if we assume a, a groundless uh, version of a uh, picture of nature, then uh, we can explain open-ended evolution in a genuine, kind of metaphysical manner. So this is my attempt to kind of portray it. Imagine that we want to have more space, more degrees of freedom at the top layer, but what can we do? Well, we could arrange, rearrange the interactions at the bottom, at the lower levels, but eventually we'll hit the bottom. It can never be more than the degrees of freedom that our bottom layer has. Ah, well, well what if actually there's another bottom level, and that has more degrees of freedom? Well, if we then tap into this level and include some of the changes, some of the properties that are available at this level, then we will be able to expand all the levels that are higher up. So, if, say, instead of having the bottom, now we're talking about level minus one, and say if it's open-ended, that will give us the possibility to talk about open-ended degrees of freedom towards the top as well. Um, so that's just mathematically speaking. And maybe there's a logic problem here, but just with those simple terms of we have components, they're non-interacting, non-interactions reduces the degrees of freedom, 
then I think this is the inevitable conclusion that if you want to have genuine open-endedness, you need to have a groundless or bottomless a picture of reality. Thank you. Yeah, so so uh, yeah, I I've thought about this too, but I but I'm, I'm I want to ask you a question. What if you instead of viewing um, what is it called strict hierarchies allow so to say things from level two or level three to interact with things from level zero or level one? Then you then as you add things as you get these high order structures and each of them then can, can interact with individuals that are component because that's what happens. You have so you have a salt and that really interacts with the third order structure in my system with, with the membrane. So the stability of a membrane is very dependent on salt. So so you, you I think that <coughs> it, it, that's my my interpretation. I, I'm not sure this is a correct picture. That right, so maybe that's actually not linear, right? Because I'm thinking well, of I'm hierarchy sure. in that term. But there, there's uh, there's you certainly capture something correct, but I think that reality is it allows you to have interactions bet also between the uh, the individual components and the higher. I agree with that, but in that case, all I'm saying is that uh, this level level two up here could, for example, then start level interacting with this one. But how much this level could produce in response to the interaction with the top layer is still constrained by the number of degrees of freedom you have here. So even though you could slightly expand the degrees of freedom higher. If this is really your bottom level, and, there, and that's it, there is a, a, a limit to how much further you can expand at the top. It's clear that there is a limit, but I, I think that uh, I think it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, just uh, uh, Dave, you want to get it? Would it perhaps be more palatable rather than saying we're going to have a whole level underneath quarks to just have level zero get bigger? and say we'll move to another solar system and we'll get the same saving of OEE that way. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that you made this point that uh, in practice, I mean, as long as we have enough dimensionality at the bottom. Or we can expand uh -huh. and acquire, we can take over Alpha Centauri, whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, we might uh, have to continue this one over time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, okay. I think, Mark, do you want to say something? Please? Well, um, actually, I want to turn things over to Tim for the last, for the last 15 minutes, is that right? Uh, yes, so we've, we've got to at one o'clock. Yeah, okay. thanks, Tom. Um, so, thank you, every everyone. I'm uh, very impressed to see that we've kept the time. Okay. Um, I have a, a, a talk on Friday morning, so if you're interested in my talk, then just come to the Friday morning. <laughs> so, we've got 15 minutes now, um, and in, in that time, I think um, maybe just to re-emphasize the structure of what happens next. Um, so there's a second meeting at the end of the conference on Friday afternoon, which is quite short, it's an hour and a quarter. But the um, intention of that is that we are, we're hoping to get some sort of working document out of this, uh, out of these two sessions, where we collectively sort of come to some um, I don't know, uh, mutual understanding of what the important issues are, um, what um, important milestones have been met in research up to this time in open-ended evolution, and what might be important milestones for future research. And what we'd really like to do is, to, um, is, to, is for this to develop into a journal article. Um, so anyone who wants to get involved at this stage um, there's a potential of a publication coming out there. Uh, can I also suggest that we have a focus on open questions? So identifying what are the, so not just milestones, but what are the real questions that we're tackling with? Because some of those are going to be a little bit vaguer than what we would be able to put into our Yeah, great idea, yes. So between now and the next session, there, there is this online Google document, which uh, there's a link on the, uh, the workshop website. So the idea is that people, uh, a few people have uh, already started contributing to that, but um, uh, as your discussions, as you discuss things with colleagues over the course of the week, please feel free to add stuff to that document. Um, I think that's all to say at this stage, but I think in the remaining 10 minutes, so it's obviously been a very quick uh, rush to schedule up to now, uh, so maybe we can just open the floor to more general
comments, questions, if anyone's got any further questions about any of the presentations or anything in general, um, to say. Alistair? Where was you said we're meeting this evening? Oh, good point, yes, <laughs> <laughs> good point. So yes, the, the other activity is uh, this evening, the idea is that we will um, go off to the pub um, down in the village, which is a short walk from here. So we will meet in the atrium just downstairs. It's the Charles. The yes. Charles, thank you. The Charles pub, yes, I, I, I can remember that. Um, in Hazlington Village, the Charles pub, if, if anyone doesn't come with uh, the main group. But we will meet down by the front doors in the atrium at 6 o'clock and, uh, and walk off to the Charles pub at that stage. Are the slides going to be available somewhere? Good question. Um, are the slides going to be available? Yes, I hope so. If, uh, so I will put them on my website, um, the ones that I have. If anyone has any objections to their slides going on their website, please tell me. Otherwise, I will assume that I can put them up on the website, on the workshop website. I think I probably have all of the, nearly all of the presentations, maybe one or two of the Mac ones I don't have. So. If, if I don't have them, if people could send them to me, that would be great and I'll put them on the website. What about this video? This video, good question. <laughs> so we are recording. Um, to be honest, I haven't given much thought about what happens next. <laughs> we will do something with the video. And uh, I, will, I will announce what, what happens, what it is that we manage to do with that. So that will be online at some point. What is your website again? The website is, um, let's see, it is tim-taylor.com slash OEE1. It is linked from the conference website. It is linked from the conference website. Oh, good point. Yeah. There we go. So are there any other more general questions or comments? Well, maybe we can start with practical questions, and then if we have some time we can uh, discuss all kinds of evolution more too. Any other practical questions? Great. We'll do the impractical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have one, actually. I want to um, start with, if I, could, if I could. This was prompted by Dave, one of the things that you said, but I think it's it's uh, showed up in a number of his talks too. You mentioned that open-ended evolution implies that you know more and more is sort of happening and so if you hit some kind of resource ceiling then this process stops and so I want to talk about resource ceilings the relationship between resource ceilings and open and evolution in fact I want us to just think about that because it seems so my impression let me tell you my impression <laughs> tell me if, if you agree or disagree uh, that of course in the actual universe there is some resource ceiling there's, amount, there's a finite amount of space a finite amount of time a finite amount of stuff and so whatever we're talking about, if there really is some kind of open-ended evolution happening, it's going to be limited by that resource. So I think we should just say what we're interested in open-ended evolution can occur within a resource limitation, and what we're interested in is what happens until you hit this ceiling. Now it's tricky because every one of these systems will go along and do something and then it stops. And so you could just say, oh, it hit the resource ceiling, so I've got open-ended evolution. No, it's not that easy. So part of the trick, I think, is for us to figure out what we mean by open-ended evolution within a resource ceiling. And we don't just mean reaching some kind of asymptote. And so one proposal would be something like, you have a finite, so in a model, how would this look? You have a finite system, and it has some resources that are limited. And you go, go let it happen, and it reaches some kind of level. But then if you increase the resources, that level should go up. You exactly. increase them some more, it should go up some more. Exactly. And for example, with Tierra, that doesn't happen. It does something, goes, you know, interesting stuff happens for a while and it sort of equilibrates. And then you add, you know, an order of magnitude more nodes and have it evolve around the internet like uh, Tom Ray did. Yeah. Nothing more happens. So that's a sign that it's not open ended, I would say. Yeah, that's exactly the, the latter part is, is where I wanted to end up that the idea of indefinite scalability is you make sure that your models are such that you can do that experiment you can double the model size and change nothing else, or times 10 the model size and do no nothing else, and you should see the ceiling now move. Uh, like that. That's, what, that's the essence of a definite scale of evidence. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, is that uh, if you have this limit of effective population size, that is 
far before the limit of, of uh, the resources. And if you increase the size of the, of the population, you don't necessarily increase the size of the effective population. True. So actually, for here, I'm just to increase to the internet. But if the size of the population of the effective population is still the same, yeah. you will not fix any mutation, even though this mutation would be favorable in possibly infinite or larger effective population. So that's the, the, the resource, I think, is not the, the main limit. The structure of the population, the, the way uh, you simulate evolution, for instance, and the speed at which a new individual will uh, spread in the population will considerably change the possibility to observe open-ended evolution in a single system. Yeah. So it's a similar response, I suppose. Um, it isn't necessarily, I think you have to be careful because it's not necessarily a resource as such that's causing the limitation. So if you were thinking about a growing population, then it's usually a resource that, that causes it to saturate. Right. Um, but in like, for example, Moore's law, it's, it doesn't really use anything, I mean, com using computers uses energy, but it doesn't really use anything up to make computers more complex. Um, so the thing that's starting to saturate Moore's law is just the, the heat dissipation from the chips, or the thing that saturates human brain size is fitting the head through the birth canal. Um, so in the case of Tierra, evidently the thing that limits the complexity isn't the number of nodes, it's probably something else, like either, the, either an entropic effect of mutations or uh, an inability to go anywhere new because there's only so many things it can do. Or, so it, the, anyway, the, the problem is to specifically identify what the limiting thing is and then remove that, I suppose. I'd like to also just mention that um, the, uh, this limit in particular affects the kind of thing that you were talking about and you were talking about where you have more higher order individuals. But the sort of thing that I was talking about and Takashi was talking about, it wasn't the individuals weren't aggregates of lower ones, but what was happening, what was open-ended was the number of traits. And you just, as more and more things happen, more and more features are being created. And that, that could, I mean, it's not so clear that there's a resource limitation on that at the same time. Well, there obviously is, it's just whether it's trite. I mean, it, it, there's plenty of room to write down traits. Right. Uh, it is limited, but that's not going to be the that's bottleneck true. in the dynamics. That's true. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, it's just a tweak of that. I think it's a very interesting experiment to do to raise the resource limits and see how you measure changes. But it's also worth looking at whether that trend is asymptotic or not. So it's not, right. not enough that you've just got a few dots going up on the graph. It's, it's got to not be heading towards a plateau. Tom Ray did talk um, back in the 90s about adding um, a limitation on the, the instructions so that he could, the, the programs couldn't copy themselves out of thin air, as it were, but, but each instruction was, um, was in a, a limited supply, and that, so there was a, a conservation of matter. But then, yes, there's a, this question of whether you artificially impose um, resource limitations on a, a digital system or or whether you go with the more natural so there is naturally the um cpu time is is a, a natural resource and and possibly the cpu time and memory space i guess are the the, the two clear limited resources <laughs> so yeah i mean just a, a quick thing so although i gave a talk claiming that, that, that eco ecological effects aren't important. I could have given a talk saying the opposite. Uh, and one, one thing to note about ecosystems is that when nutrients are limiting uh, rather than energy, that tends to be when things get really complex. So that's just like a, that's just a thing to throw out there and say that maybe, maybe the type of limiting resource can matter and actually can be good. Yeah. yeah. The, the point I wanted to make was that uh, CPUs and RAM are not scalable technologies. The concept of CPU is not scalable if by no other reason than the light cone of everything having to reach the CPU. So you have to move to another model of computation if you're going to be strictly scalable. And so I just want to end with a plug that it could be that if you adopted a different architecture, a different programming model, a different programming language, perhaps, you could sort of automatically be in the realm of indefinitely scalable, where you could do this times 10 and not have to worry about, oops, the CPU just pooped out. And at my talk on Wednesday, I will be introducing such a new programming language called ULAM. It's now available in Ubuntu packages for everybody to play with. That's my Fantastic. I think there's one more point from Charles over there and then uh, we'll...
So it's for today. Yeah, so I actually just want to agree with both of you. So, t so Tim, in terms of, the, of systems like Tierra, if you do take, if, if you relax some of the CPU cycle constraints, you do get to see somewhat more complex uh, uh, organisms come out of it. However, uh, with Dave's point, I think uh, um, it is really critical that shifting the, the sort of underlying CPU model is what really happen, what needs to happen in order to see dramatic uh, increases in complexity. And when you start giving them abilities to interact in more sophisticated ways, you do indeed see, indeed see things more akin to a major transition where you have groups of organisms where the is Okay, okay. And you should not forget that if you do that, then there, if groups of organisms are evolving together as an entity, the other individuals have not disappeared. I mean, it is multi-level evolution. Oh, I have the feeling that, 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 that this word, I would have expected it this morning, multi-level evolution. You see the evolution of, of, of things getting together and being a new entity, but it's not like the other entities don't exist. I mean, they still feed back on one another. It's exactly as, as uh, Steen said. Hmm. It's like an avalanche after avalanche after avalanche, you know. Sure, and right. And, and of course you have top-down causation. And, and yeah, yeah, they know of course they interact and takes right. them and them. Yes, yeah, that's true. I think Mark has just one final comment and then we'll pull it. Yeah, this was just we'll to really. say I appreciate the Takashi, Dave, others who have um, given advertisements for their talks coming up, so I wanted to explicitly open the door. If anyone else here is giving a talk at this conference on something related to open-ended evolution, here's a chance for you to make a plug. Anyone want to? I did some on, I mean, that's why I came to this workshop, because I'm pretty new to it. Uh, I did some on with ongoing uh, evolution, not anything going with complexity uh, and a somewhat provocative title for which perhaps I'm now already a bit afraid. Afraid is where does co-evolution lead to? Is that a talk here? That's a talk here on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Tuesday at 2. Okay. Any others? Okay. Hope to see you again on Friday at the end of the afternoon. And uh, remember about the online document if you want to make a contribution. Thanks to you.